I want us to think about that for a moment. Oh, come, all you faithful. Oh, come, let us adore Him. I think about the Scripture and what it says in Come and let us reason together, says the Lord. Come and let us deal with this situation that though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Is anyone thirsty? The Scripture says, Come and let him drink. Even if he has no money, take your choice. Come and take freedom. Jesus looks at those disciples and says, come and follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Come unto me all you who are weary, you are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. Learn of me. I look at what the scripture, Jesus looks at Zacchaeus and he says, Zacchaeus, come down from there. For, come down. Come from that place where you are and come to where I'm at. Come down. Paul writes and says it this way, that we have this invitation to God's presence to come boldly into God's throne room. Without fear, without anxiety, but to come boldly into His presence. To, break our, to make our prayers and our peti petitions known to God. To come. And I look at how, how much over and over Jesus looks at Peter and he says, tells Peter to come to him on the water. The Bible even says that the spirit of the bride say come. Let anyone who hear say come. And from Isaiah to Revelation, we see this invitation of Jesus to come, an invitation of His presence, an invitation to experience Him, an invitation to know Him, to see Him, to truly encounter Him. This morning, I want to talk to you about that invitation to come. Perhaps the most terrifying and the most exciting, life-changing words we can ever hear come from the Father when, when we, He says those words to come and see. To come and see, to come and experience. And last week we talked about O oh, come Emmanuel and how it was humanity's cry for, for God to come to us and have, but yet it's really God's cry to come and see what God has done. To come and behold Him, born the King. 700 years before there was a decree. That taxes should be taken or before there was a Roman Empire. Before a star blazed across the sky. Before a virgin ever conceived. Before angels ever sang. Before a cry ever went up from a manger in Bethlehem. The prophet Isaiah proclaimed the coming of this king. And he said that the nations will come and the king will bow before him. Isaiah kind of gave one of those save the day. It's on its way. Some 700 years before, he said, hey, say today, because there's a Messiah coming, there's a King coming. An invitation to God's presence. I kind of like invitation. Anybody ever get an invitation in the mail? You did a birthday party to a wedding, to a graduation. I, you know, I always like invitations. Part of it because I did so many years of printing. I have, you may not know this about your pastor, but the first... Ten years of my life or our ministry, I was bivocational. That meant I worked for another company and did ministry on the side. And, and what I did, I worked for a printing company. I worked for a company called R. Dominic Sons. They print a lot of Bibles, a lot of magazines, and, and a lot of I worked for a trade division that print trade magazines like sign magazines or meat industry or veterinary magazines. Just a lot of stuff like that. And so I like paper. I like print. And particularly invitations because they get so decorated. And I love to see what people do with them. I got one the other day and uh, a Christmas card and, and how it had this 3D effect and, and it had this little, of course it was Charlie Brown because somebody knows me enough to know I like Charlie Brown. And they sent me had a Charlie Brown Christmas tree and, and on top of it, instead of a star, of course, was this little woodstock and he was like 3D. He was sticking up above everything. And what they can do with paper. I like it. I like it. I like it. 
You know, they say that an invitation tells a lot about you because it will tell, you, you can tell what kind of event you're going to most of the time by the invitation. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, you, you know it, it's a little prestige and it's got like four envelopes inside of it, right? You know, you open one envelope and then get to the other envelope, which inside has an invitation with an RSVP envelope. And so the more, the more envelopes you go along the way, you know it's got a little more class. I just, just say it. And so it's just amazing what invitations say about us. This was more than a piece of paper. It was more than a birthday party, more than a wedding. It was an invitation of, of one of a kind. It was an invitation to a deeper relationship. It was an invitation into being transformed. An invitation to a life change. And you and I have received that invitation to come into this place and, and, and experience transformation. I think about the time in my life when Kim knelt down on one knee and she, and she asked me to be her husband. <laughs> and my life would never be the same. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, and then I said yes. <laughs> that it, it, it didn't go down that way. It was going to be kind of boring the way it went down. You know, I thought about that. You know, most guys, if a guy's ever got any spunk to him, that's where he places all his effort it, it, is in asking her to marry him. You know, it's usually not like one of those things where they go out to see a movie and these guys aren't going to look so good. You think we ought to get married? No, no, usually guys put a lot of effort into this. And I, and I have seen all kinds of stuff through the years. I have even participated in some of that. Some of you know that Matt and Christy, they, he proposed to her right up here on this platform. And so I, 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 I've seen a lot of different things go on with that. And I think about that because, you know, that's kind of like Christmas. It's a prepared love. You know, love isn't just something emotionally we feel in the moment. But genuine love is a prepared love. You know, you guys, we're going to go into Christmas, we just come through Thanksgiving. You know, a lot of moms, a lot of wives, the way you show your love is how you get in that kitchen and you bake those recipes and you lay all that food out. Some of that stuff we take for granted is a display of their love. That, 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 that You know, we say it, oh, this is made with TLC, but it really is made with TLC because they could have sent, gave you some money and told you to go to KFC and pick up a bucket of chicken. But they didn't. They, they got in there and they sweat over that and they mixed and made and, 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 and pulled those recipes and, and figured out which recipe they were going to do. That's a job. Now that you've got the internet, you can be bombarded by recipes. Amen. And, 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 and because it's love prepared. That's what a marriage proposal is. You know, that guy thinks about all everything he's going to do ahead of time. He thinks about whether he's taking her to a ball game, if he's done paid the money to get it up on the big screen on the ball game. Whatever it takes to make that an impactful moment, that's love prepared. And that's what Christmas is. <coughs> Christmas was love prepared. That God so loved the Lord, He sent His Son. He prepared. He prepared for this moment that we could come in relationship with with him. So many times that God would love us enough that he invite us to come, to come be part of his family. I think it's amazing that you and I have received an invitation to be the fam part of the family of God. And I think the core of the Christmas message is the invitation to see Jesus for who he truly is. To see him. An invitation to behold him greet Him, to adore Him, an invitation to His coming. And a lot of times we, in churches, we often always think about the cross. I know the cross is the centerpiece of so much of what, what we believe because it's for salvation, it's purchased for you and I. But there would be no cross without a manger. Matter of fact, I think for some of us, because we don't teach enough, or we don't know enough about the birth of Jesus, that we miss some of the, the depth to the cross. We miss some of the meaning and, 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 and the powerful truth that comes out through the cross because we don't understand the beginning. We don't understand the manger. And because we don't understand the beginning when, when those first nights in Bethlehem, and we don't understand what God did there, sometimes we miss the depth of the cross. And so I think tonight, we, or this morning, we have to go back to that first night. Before we can look at the cross, 
that dealt with our sin. The cross where, where Jesus became a substitution for us that we could find salvation, where our sins are exchanged for righteousness. Before we can come to the foot of the cross, we have to go to the manger. We have to hear the invitation to come and see Him as He is. A place where history has changed, a place where life truly begins, a place where our destiny would forever be transformed. We had to invite people to the cradle first. That before there was a death of a man on the cross, there was a baby born in a manger. And understand his story. Understand the story of the baby so we can understand the story of the Savior. Again, I'm not downplaying the cross, but I want to elevate what happened at the manger this morning. I want us to get this in our spirit. And I want us to have attention to what Christ really did that he came. Because when we see Jesus, see Jesus like He really is. It changes everything. It changes the perception that we have about this relationship. It changes. It removes some of the hang-ups, some of the frustrations, some of the fears, some of the animosities that we have. It, it removes some of the hindrances in our life. When we really see who He is, and when we really see who He is, we can't help but fall at His feet in worship. We can't help but come and adore Him. You see, the miracle of Easter begins the miracle of Christmas. The substitution of man on the cross makes no sense without an incarnated baby in a manger. That word incarnation is a big word to say that, that he was fully God laying there in that manger. He was fully God. He had all the power of God. He was God. And he was incarnated, made flesh. The God who made the very flesh he was <coughs> contained in he made the very flesh he was contained in and contained himself to that to become God in the flesh. One of the verses of that song that we sung says, Word of the Father now in flesh appearing. So we'll get to the cross but the start of the manger. I want us to be real this morning because many of us start when we look at the manger, we look at Christmas, we often have these ideological uh, Christmas scenes in our head. You know, we see little precious moment figurines around a little precious moment stable with precious moment donkeys and precious moment uh, sheep, and you know what I'm talking about. And it's real clean and crisp and we forget that it's dirty and dingy. And I shared last week, most likely it was a cave. Most likely it's a stone feeding trough that's been um, hewn out of stone. And, and guess what? I don't know if you've ever had been to the farm. If you, if you need to experience this, you can look, you can see Jarvis and Cindy, and you go to the farm with them and go hang out with some goats. And, and listen, hey, Jarvis, how do goats smell? No good to me. <laughs> you made a good shepherd with it. Kim don't care for them, no. though. <laughs> they, they smell fresh, don't they? Yeah. And listen, the reality, the reality, what I'm telling you is that it's dirty. And listen, have any of you guys ever had the privilege of, of, of seeing your wife bring your child into the world? And was that clean, too? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be very honest this morning without being um, too dramatic. But, but listen, that's nasty. <laughs> it may be beautiful but that's nasty and that's real and listen I mean here's a child here's a mother that has just went through labor listen I'm telling you I've seen these pictures of Mary after it's all over and she's just all radiant Kim was not radiant when Nathan came out <laughs> and she used some voices on me I didn't even know I didn't even know they were in there I thought I needed a priest at one point. I, I was helping her, had a leg pushed back, and, 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 the, and the doctor said, okay, we're going to take a month break. And I didn't let her leg down quick enough, and it was like, don't touch me. <laughs> and, and that's the exact voice, by the way. <laughs> so I, I'm just like, you know, ooh. Uh, I'm just telling you that this this is a very rare, and, and then come on. Away in a manger, no crib for a bed. Now just say somewhere, 
you know, the baby, no crying he made. Yeah, that's real. So, so, so because he's so God, he, don't, he, he just don't cry. Listen, he was a very real baby in a very real body. He did very natural things, and he cried. Amen. There was cries coming through the night. There was smells galore. There was, there, there was, there was dirt and, and filth, and, and yet, this is where God sent his son. We have to make sure that we don't sterilize it so much that we make it so perfect, so holy, that it's not real. I said so holy that it's not real. And we realize that God loved us enough that He sent His Son that He would come into that. You see, it's, it's not a Charles Dickens painting. It's or a Charles Dickens story. It's not a it's not a Rockwell painting of the late forties. No, it's it's a very real life, a very real life with with with, with cries and anguish. I mean. That woman went through labor. I mean, with no midwife. I mean, Joseph was everything. A good thing he probably had helped bring some sheep in the world, I guess. I don't know. He was a carpenter. I don't know where he got experience, but somehow they got that baby here. I mean, I, there's a lot of chaos going on. I mean, let's just be honest. I mean, angels are popping up singing to, to, to shepherds. <laughs> what would you do if you saw an angel? It almost sounds like a Halloween night. There's spirits popping out everywhere. <laughs> It might be more like Halloween than what we think of Christmas. I mean, I mean, all of a sudden, a host of angels, you're like, we're, we're gone. We're good thing, I mean, good thing the angel really quickly said, peace, peace, <laughs> thank you. I mean, there's just a lot of fear and a lot of chaos going on. And yet, this is where God sends His Son. His Son, born flesh and blood, incarnated, God of the universe, God of all creation, the sustainer of life, become a fetus in the womb of a woman. The God, the maker of humanity, becomes this little babe. And he had a physical birth. He grew. He cried. He slept. He ate. He pooped. <laughs> you know babies? Babies poop. He experienced what we experience. He was tempted like we're tempted. He was fully man, flesh and blood. God Almighty come with skin on. And because he was fully man, he was able to take our place on the cross. See, if he had not been fully man, he could have not taken our place and been a substitute. Because he was fully man and without sin, he could take our place on the Roman cross. And die for us that we could have forgiveness. Matter of fact, that was one of the first bad teachings in the church was that somehow Jesus couldn't possibly have been a man, that he just appeared, that he was not born. That was one of the early. That's why Paul writes to the Colossian church in the first chapter of Colossians and really makes it known the supremacy of Christ and how by him and fall him all things were made. The miracle of the incarnation, the baby in the manger, born of a woman, a man who was also fully God. His birth was supernatural. I mean, even later on, he claims that he's God. Demons claim that he's God. And even God the Father claims that he's God. That he lived a perfect, sinless life. And the call of that, he's able to stand in our place and with without sin, without corruption, take our place and represent us to God and justify us so that we don't have to bear the mark of sin and the judgment of sin on our life. Here's the miracle of Christmas is that when we see Jesus, we see one who is fully man and fully God. So when we see Jesus, we see, the, we see one who's fully man and fully God. And, and, and hear me this morning because this is something I love. Is that, that Let me teach you a little bit. Matter of fact, one the second bad teachings of the church that, that, that wound up having them call a special council, the Council of Nasis, which we get the Nasician Code and Nasician Creed from. Uh, in, in, in 325 AD was that there was a, a guy by the name of Aries who was, who was teaching this philosophy that Jesus was not God. That he was not co-equal with God. He was not co-eternal with God. Rather, God the Father created Jesus. And Jesus was just a created being a little bit lower than the angels. And while 
Arius was giving his decree before the council. This is this is this this group of bishops, all these church leaders. They are meeting. They are, and, and he's making his argument for why he believes what he believes. This other bishop gets up and he walks up to him and he punches him in the mouth for speaking heresy and blasphemy, for 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 denying the deity of Jesus Christ. You know who that bishop was? His name was Nicholas. Matter of fact, he would later become Saint Nick, and you, many know him as Saint Nicholas. Later to be called Father Christmas, Santa Claus, everything else down the road. You see, you see, Nicholas was so. Matter of fact, they actually debishoptized him for just a while. He actually lost his bishopship until because of his outrage, because of his, his action and not controlling himself and, and, and punching this other brother in the face. Uh, you see, I love it. Nicholas's first naughty and nice list was not whether you were good or not, it was whether you were a heretic or not. <laughs> and so what he does is, is, is he becomes, when we talk about Father Christmas, he was the father of the very faith because he had, he had, he had staked everything on the deity of Christ. Without this deity, what does Christmas even mean? Without it being God incarnate, what did it even mean? And so long before there was ever toys given out in his name, it was all about the fact that he's the very one who had saved Christmas by the fact that he had proclaimed and stayed true that this, this celebration that we have in the midst of December was the birth of the Savior, of, of the Son of God, God incarnated. So you may not know that about Nicholas, but now you do. You'll think about that next time you see that guy in that red suit. <laughs> Long before there was toys, he was a defender of the faith. A hero. That was why his fame elevated. was because he was the one that stood for truth. He protected Emmanuel, God with us, God in us. And see, Scripture gives us a cast of characters I want to cover real quickly tonight. And I know I've got to get into, I keep saying tonight and this morning, I've got to get into to some Scripture because this is church and we've got to have Scripture. Um, I want us to look and be honest that, that, that 2,000 years ago, there might have been a lot of differences, but there was also a lot of similarities. Not far from the same world we kind of live in today. I believe that that first Christmas had a lot of hustle and bustle going on. That, that city of Bethlehem was flooded with people. There was people everywhere. I mean, I mean there, were, there were people passing in the street. There was chaos. And in the midst of that chaos is when God brings His Son into the world. And He sends peace, eternal peace to us. And I believe that we may live in a world that's going to and fro and, and there's all kinds of craziness this time of year, but you can have peace in the middle of it. I want to look first at Joseph's story in Matthew chapter 1. The Bible tells us about Joseph, this man, this carpenter of Nazareth. And it says this, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was pledged to, to, to marry Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Now, just so you'll know, in Middle Eastern cultures, it was not uncommon that up to a year before they were actually married as husband and wife, they would be betrothed to each other. And that betrothal engaged, and that engagement was just as good as a marriage, with the exception they would not consummate that marriage until they were officially married. But they saw each other, they spent time with each other, but they did not have intercourse, sex, until after they were officially married, but, but it was to give them a time. It was treated. It was supposed to be just as sacred. She was not to have any more friends. He was not supposed to have any girlfriends. They were committed. It was just like a marriage. They were they, they were vowed to each other. And so, it, it, and it had a lot of requirements with it. it. To break that commitment was just like breaking up a marriage. And so here's what happens. She's pregnant. And an angel says, she's going to be found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit because Joseph, her fiancé, was a righteous man. He did not want to expose her to public disgrace. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. But after he had considered this, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home to be your wife because 
what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will give him the name Jesus, Yahshua, because he will save his people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him to do. He took Mary home to be his wife. And the first thing I often like to say here is seriously. I mean, you, okay. I share with you, I mean, let's just be real for a moment. Let's just be raw. I mean, to be in a relationship and, and, and to be engaged to somebody and, and, and you're planning on a marriage and you know that you have not been, been that you've not slept around and she's not slept around and, and, and you come into that marriage relationship and, and just before, just months before you're, you're to really get married and tie the knot, she looks at you and she says, we need to talk. And she tells you that she's with child. And she tells you that it's the Holy Ghost. Anybody see where I'm going with this? <laughs> because all the disbelief you would have today is all the disbelief Joseph had then. And you being parents, imagine if it was happening to your son. And his girlfriend has just told you that she's pregnant. She's pregnant with God's kid. Yeah, yeah, that, that disbelief you got, that's the same disbelief all Joseph's family had too. Do we see how real this is? And in Joseph, who was a good man, who, who was going to put her away privately... And he's faced with these choices because by, by law he had this ability to put her away, to, 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 to do away with this marriage and go on with his life. All of a sudden, the Holy Spirit asked him, the angel of the Lord asked him to make a decision that's not his normal decision. And, and to change the way that he normally thinks in his culture, in his society, that he's going completely against the flow of his society. Tell me God don't ask you to do some hard things sometimes. Amen. Tell me God sometimes doesn't ask you to give up things you love. Because this was going to change the way everybody looked at him, the way everybody thought about him, the way everybody thought about her. It was going to change their world. He lived in a very conservative climate. And now by taking her on to be his wife, they were, everybody was going to say, yeah, he did that because that was his kid. And the only two that knew the truth at that moment was Joseph and Mary. Well, and God. We get to find out later on. But think about what they had to walk through. Think about the hurdles that Joseph had to face. And he had to make a decision. He, how, he's, how he was supposed to personally act and respond to the news, but also how he, had, he was going to publicly act and respond to the news. You know, I'd have a few questions if it was been me. I would need to know some stuff. I would be like, God, okay, if that's you, God, then can you like give me a billboard going out of town that says, take Mary as your wife, this is the Holy Ghost. <laughs> you know, just anything small like that, God would work for me. <laughs> but no, he had to go by an angel just say, hey. And then we know that he was obedient because he got up and did it. He took Mary as his wife. You see, it's one thing to hear God's voice. It's another thing to obey God's voice. He said, we talk about that all the time because we even in this vision set, we talk about love God, live the life, share Christ. It's easy to believe that. It's easy to believe that. But do we live that? And once we live that, do we experience that? Because, you see, when we believe and we live it out, then it brings experience to our life. And for Joseph to experience God like God wanted him to experience him, and like we were going to experience him, he had to be obedient. And he had to step out and take Mary as his wife. Not only to hear what God's instruction was, but to fulfilled it. Joseph was obedient. He reacted in a way that was against everything that he knew. He risked it all. His reputation, his relationships. He went against the social norms of his day because he saw something about Jesus. He trusted God and he obeyed. Now look at Mary's story this morning. The Bible gives it to us in Luke. It says that Gabriel appeared to her and he said, Greetings, favored woman of the Lord. The Lord is with you. 
And we all like to hear the Lord is with you. We all like to hear that. But most of the time, after the Lord shows up to give us something, can I just tell you that when God asks you to do something, it's never easy. Because God's going to always ask you to do something that's going to grow you. And to benefit others, to benefit this world, Mary and Joseph had to be obedient for us to... If, if, listen, that makes it no different than the very thing God's going to step into your life and ask you to do. And when He steps into your life and He asks you to do something, it's going to cost you something. But for it to be a reward to you and everybody else around you, you have to be obedient. That's right. God, God always takes us to this, 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 this climax of faith where we have to step out and trust Him. And for, it, for us to, to really receive the, the fruition of what God wants to do in our life, we have to be willing to cross, to step out, to walk through that doorway into the promise that God has for us. I like what verse 29 says, confused and disturbed. Yeah, I think if the Lord spoke to me, I was married, I'd be confused and disturbed. That's probably the understatement of the Bible, confused and disturbed. Verse 29 says that confused and disturbed, Mary says, tried to think to, to think what the angel could mean. What, what are you talking about? I'm blessed. I'm not gonna... He said, don't be afraid, Mary. The angel told her, you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and he will be Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David and he will reign over Israel before his kingdom will be forever and his kingdom will never end. And Mary asked the angel, but how can this happen? I'm a virgin. I love the fact that at least Mary, Joseph didn't even get a question in there. He just got the instruction of the Lord. But Mary at least gets this question in there and she says, how can this be? Because, you know, I may be young, but I know how this thing works. I know how I know, I know I, this is an agricultural society. They know how sheep are, are made. They know how things work in this type of culture. And he's like, I'm a virgin. I've never been with a man. How can I have a child? How can he be special? And the angel replies to her and says, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you so that the baby that's born, he will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. What more, your relative Elizabeth has become pregnant in her old age. She says, Elizabeth, Elizabeth is too old to have a baby, but I... She's got a baby now. She's in her sixth month of her, and for nothing is impossible with God. And Mary responds, I am the Lord's servant. May everything you've said about me come true. And the angel left her. I love the way that even though this perplexed Mary, her response is, Lord, I'm your servant. I'm your handmaid. I'll be obedient. Mary is invited to this grand adventure. Joseph was invited. Mary is invited. And she didn't, just, she didn't just worship from afar off. No, no. She is watching from the front row. She is watching from the front seat. She is a part of what's going on. That God is going to come inside of you. And He's going to come into the world through you. And Mary is invited into this story. Risking her reputation, her relationship, everything that her social norms have, have said. All, all that she's ever lived for has been thrown away plan of God to be manifested in her life. Do you get that this morning? A young girl who has lived virtuously, who has believed it and taught it, now is going to be ridiculed for the very thing that she lived her life against. But the plan of God to come to fruition. Mary is not just passive observer. She is in the front seat saying, yes, Lord. Let it be. Let it be. She said, I'm the Lord's servant. Whatever God asked him. You see, Mary and Joseph, they were invited into the chaos. Listen, sometimes the step God has for you, He will invite you into chaos before structure and order and promise comes. That's for somebody this morning because you're standing on the edge and you're looking at chaos. I'm telling you, sometimes He invites you into the chaos. And their life is not going to get easier from here on. They were the blessed ones. They were the promised ones. They were the favored ones. And it would... And everything's just the break loose. When this goes public, they're not going to people be walking around with billboards saying, well, yay for Joseph and Mary. 
there's going to be people shunning them. so self-righteous. He's always said he, how holy he is. You know, he's always all pious. But that's not really who he is. You know, he got that girl pregnant. He got married pregnant. Yeah, that's what he did. You know who they are. <coughs> I, I, just, I just want you to get that this morning. I want you to understand what they were thrown into for the plan of God to work. They were risking everything with anticipation that they saw God was doing something. There was this anticipation of what they saw and what they heard was real before anything ever changed. And then the next players of this story this morning, as I get ready to close, is the shepherds. These guys. These guys are just common, everyday people. They, they remind me uh, of you. They are totally blue collar. And they're just like us this morning. And it says that night they were in Luke, it says in chapter 2, that the shepherds were in the fields nearby guarding their flocks. And suddenly as the angel of the Lord appeared among them, the radiance and the glory of God surrounded them. Tell me, that would scare the fool out of you. <laughs> I mean, listen, we live in days with helicopters and spotlights and all that kind of stuff. They didn't have that. All of a sudden, angels show up in the sky, and there's light all around you, and it's illuminated, and the heavens are full of angels singing. Listen, we know what lights and laser shows are. These guys are 2,000 years ago uh, rule clap. I mean, come on. Let's just, let's just get this. And all of a sudden, the glory of God is displayed around them. And, 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 and the first word, thank the Lord, that the angel says is, don't be afraid. I bring you good news. And, and it will be great joy to all the people that the Savior, the Messiah, the Lord has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David, and you will, you will recognize Him by this sign. You will find Him wrapped, notice what it is, in strands of cloth, in swaddling cloth. I talked about that last week. You need to go and hear that if you're online. And He goes on to say, verse 16, And they hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what they had happened and what the angel had said to them about the child. And, and all who heard the shepherd's story, they were astonished. Look at your neighbor and say, astonished. Astonished. No, no, say it that way. Astonished. Astonished. Say it with you. Astonished. Astonished. They were astonished at what was told to them. And the shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. And hear this this morning. Those shepherds, those ordinary men, came into an extraordinary adventure. They came in the middle of chaos because they were invited by God to come and see. And they came and they saw Jesus. And their response was to run out and tell everyone what they had seen. What they had found. To glorify God. To praise Him. And while Mary is in the midst of all this chaos. In the midst of the animals. And, and the angels singing. And, and the shepherds. And in the midst of the smell. And the hay. And the dirt. And the field. Giving birth to this baby. Mary stops for a moment. And she thinks. About what she has experienced so far. How good God has been to her to let her be the mother of His promise. And she reflects on the child that she holds. She has been invited to see Jesus. Not only to see Jesus, but to bring Him into this world. And she saw something that night that she, the Bible says that she kept close to her heart. She pondered it in her heart. She meditated it in her heart. Oh, come let us adore him. A baby in a stone feeding trough for animals. God in human flesh. The creator in the skin of his own creation. Does that not just leave a sense of wonder in your life? Does that not just cause you to be awestruck, to be dumbfounded that God the Almighty comes in the form of a baby? The God who hung the stars in their place, who calls them each by name, I mean, when you think about the billions of light years this guy is, he comes as a baby, wrapped in swaddling cloth, a tiny infant. Who will come with us, adore him. Let us see him for who he is. These shepherds, Mary and Joseph, 
They did not respond to an invitation just because it happened to show up. No, they realized that God was doing something and they wanted to be a part of it. They wanted to experience. They realized that the invitation was real and it was to be a part of something bigger than themselves. That word adoration that I, you hear me quoting over and over means to worship God for who He is. For what He's done. Nikki, if you'll come. And what we find is that when we see Jesus for who He really is, we can't help but worship. When we realize how awesome and how great He is, as we give our worship to Him, it opens our eyes to be able to see Him more clear. And as we see Him more clear, we're just bathed in, in, in the awesomeness of His presence that we just have to worship more. And it's just like a, a repetitive cycle that as I come and I bring my worship to Him, it opens my eyes to begin to see Him clearer, to understand Him more. And as I adore Him more, as I worship Him for who He is, as I, as I worship Him in awe of who He is, all of a sudden I get a revelation of a greater understanding of who He is. And it makes me want to just worship more. It makes me want to praise Him, honor Him. That's what Christmas is. One of the things we have. Adoration helps us to see Christ more fully. And when we see Christ more fully, it leads us to more adoration. That's why there's angels in heaven whose only job is to stand and say, Holy, 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 holy. That's their job. We've come to His presence to see who He is and to worship Him. To know that He's fully God. See, adoration has two parts. Adoration is just is more than just a state of mind or state of our, but it's a state of our heart. It's something that moves us into action. You see, it has to move us into action, and that's what it did for Joseph. Joseph stood, and then Joseph refused just to set out, but he engaged what God spoke. He he stepped outside his normal choices. And see, I just believe when you really experience God, you'll step outside your normal choices. You'll step out the normality of this world. You'll step outside of what the world is doing and how the world sees life. When you, we really begin to experience Christ, all of a sudden we step outside of all the things that we know in this world and we begin to live differently. And live by a different standard and live to a different calling because we give ourselves to something much higher. What does it mean to act like Joseph? How he lived in this story? Joseph, when he saw Jesus for who he was, he decided the actions to put someone else, someone else's good above his own good. To put Mary's good, to put this baby good, and to put the whole world's good above his own. Oh, he could have took the easy road. He could have divorced her in the night and went on with his life. Somewhere down the story, had lived out his years. But he said, No, I'll walk this road of difficulty with my reputation scarred, with whatever it takes for the promise to come. How can we act in such a way this Christmas is by putting someone else's highest good before our own? Make someone else. It may look that way at your dinner table. Listen, I understand that there's chaos. There's chaos in the world. Some of our chaos is not what's going on at Walmart. Your chaos is what's going to go on at the dinner table in your house. But you say, you know what? I'm going to look. I'm going to set someone else at the forefront of how I act. Worship isn't just 20 minutes of service. Worship is the way we live our life. How we're alive towards Christ, adoring Christ. It means that we respond to this invitation that He's given us to come and see. And when we come and see, we experience change and we embrace change. That I refuse to look on the face of God's greatest gift and remain the same way I always have. I've got to be changed. I want to be more like his glory to shine in me. 
Another way that adoration expresses itself is through taking time to just stop like Mary did and reflect on God's goodness. And think about how good God's been to you. Listen, you probably can list and make a long list of everything that's gone wrong this year. But we spend very little time stopping and thinking about how good God's been. And when you stop for a moment, you begin to count your blessings. As the old song says, name them one by one. It will surprise you to see what the Lord has done. And you begin to count those blessings and you realize how good and how awesome, awesome of a God you serve. And in the middle of a chaotic world, that He brings peace. And when you focus your mind, what does the prophet Isaiah say? He says, He will be at perfect peace whose mind is stayed on the Lord. And when you focus your mind, on the things of God and on all that He's done and how good He's been, you're going to find in the middle of the chaos, you're going to find peace holds you. And you'll be at perfect peace. That in the world of insanity and chaos, Christ stepped in to bring that peace. Meditate on it. Think on it. Reflect on His goodness. His sovereignty. Right now, that may mean that you just need to start making a list in your mind of how good God has been to you, how faithful He's been. This week, you may need to sit down and write down some notes of how good He's been. But the last expression of adoration is like these shepherds. One guy said it this way, worship is bragging on God and evangelism. Excuse me, say it this way. That worship is bragging on God about God and evangelism is bragging on God to somebody. Worship is bragging on God to God. And evangelism is bragging on God to others. You guys have got an invite card. On the Christmas Eve, we're going to celebrate. We're going to have fun in this place. We're going to worship the Lord. Bring your family. Invite somebody. Two times a year, people come to church. Christmas, Easter. What if your invitation gets somebody in this place and they give their life to Christ that Sunday morning? That Sunday, I mean, that, that Saturday night. Their life will forever be changed. If they see Jesus for who He really is, and their life is, that's what it's all about. It's not about toys and trees and turkeys or hounds. It's about Jesus. You see, when those shepherds experienced Him, when they saw who He was, the Bible says they left telling everybody what they had seen and heard. And I just think part of our adoration this morning is that when we leave this place, when we come to that place of encounter and, and, and when we experience Jesus Christ, that we leave this place telling people what we've both seen and heard. And listen, I've tasted and I've seen that the Lord is good. I know that the Christ has the power to change life. I know what He's done in my life. And when we begin to brag on God to other people, you can't help but watch God begin to change lives. I just believe that. I think that's, I know that it's part of adoration. It leads us to a place of proclaiming God and who God really is. And this morning we come, and, and I just want to say some of us need to come to the maker. We just need to experience the reality of who Jesus is. But others of us, we need to come to the cross. Some of us this morning need to invite Him into our life to be our Savior. We know that where you're at this morning, that you're not in relationship with God. God gives us these words. The invitation has been written to you. Come. Come to me. Come into my presence. The price is already paid. Every head bow, every eye closed. I want to ask if you're in this place this morning. You don't have that personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You've never surrendered your life to Him. You've never made Him Lord of your life. Today is your day. The Spirit says, Come. Come. If that's you this morning, and you today, you say, Pastor, I want to surrender my life to Christ. I want things to be right between me and God. I want Him to be the Lord of my life. If that's you, very quickly. I want to pray with you. I'm not going to ask you to come forward, but I want to pray with you. I want you to slip your hand up very quickly. I'm not going to wait long. Is there one? 
And I want us to do this this morning. I want us to stand our feet as believers. I want to pray over you as they lead us in this worship course. Before we leave out of here today, I want to ask our prayer team if they'll come forward. If you have a need, you need prayer in your body. We want to believe with you. We believe in the power of laying your hands and seeing God do miraculous things. They're going to pray with you. They want to, we're going to agree God to move in your situation and circumstances. And, and here's what we're going to do this morning. I want to pray as we go through this season that God will give us fresh eyes. That we'll adore Him. That we'll leave this place just like those shepherds. Bragging on God for everybody we've seen. Oh, wait till you see. Wait till you hear what God's done in my life. Let me tell you what my God is doing. Let me let, Oh, you can't. You, you've got to hear what God did for me today. And when we start living lives like that, I'm going to tell you, people are going to be forever transformed. Father, today, we ask you, Lord, to open our eyes and our hearts, God. Give us minds to see Christ as he really is. That, that he is God in the flesh. That, that baby wrapped in those, in, those, in those swaddling cloth, he was God incarnate. God wrapped in the flesh. And as he hung on that cross, he was not just a mere man. He was God and man. Father, we thank you that you would love us enough to give us the greatest gift of Christmas. And God, like Mary, we meditate on your goodness. And at Joseph, we step out in action to be obedient. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship together.